Hello, and welcome to the Hoover Institution's 2013 Fall Retreat. I'm Chris Dower, Hoover's Director of Marketing and Strategic Communications. Our speaker in this video is Joshua Rao, a senior fellow at the Hoover Institution and a professor of finance at the Stanford Graduate School of Business. The title of his talk is Hidden Debts, the U.S. Government's Pension Guarantees, and it was recorded on Tuesday, October 29th, 2013. Well, thanks very much. It's a pleasure to be here today. Um, so I'm talking about uh, corporate pensions today. May, some of you may have heard the talks that I've uh, given in the past about uh, state and local government pension systems and the fact that state and local government taxpayers are um, you know, on, on the hook for, for much more in the way of pension promises to uh, public employees than we had thought. Topic today is a little bit different. It's about uh, the U.S. government's pension guarantees. And this is with regards to the U.S. government's guarantees of the corporate defined benefit pension system. And it's, uh, this is a, a presentation that's based on a paper that I've written with uh, my colleague uh, Jules van Binsbergen at the Business School uh, and also Robert Novi Marx. He's at the University of Rochester. That paper has a long uh, title that I, that, that paper's called Financial Valuation of PBGC Insurance with Market Implied Default Probabilities. So I'm going to be translating that for you into English over the next half an hour. Okay, that's basically what the, what the, what the talk is going is to be about. Um, but it's about how the U.S. government has got a lot of guarantees of, of corporate pensions that uh, aren't properly measured and aren't really, uh, people, a lot of people aren't aware of. So uh, maybe you've heard of this or maybe you haven't. Uh, there is a government corporation. That means a quasi-governmental entity, and I'll describe why it's a quasi-governmental entity in a minute, called the Pension Benefit Guarantee Corporation, a U.S. government agency, and it's called the PBGC. And it is a government corporation that ensures the defined benefit pensions of workers and retirees in firms, and in particular in bankrupt firms. Uh, so the basic idea behind the Pension Benefit Guarantee Corporation, or the PBGC, is that when a firm uh, that sponsors a traditional defined benefit pension plan, when that firm enters into Chapter 11 bankruptcy, uh, the firm has the right to essentially dump the pension obligation onto the Pension Benefit Guarantee Corporation. What does the Pension Benefit Guarantee Corporation get? They get the assets that the company had set aside to attempt to fund these pension promises. And I say attempts to fund because basically no firm goes bankrupt with a fully funded defined benefit pension plan. They're only going bankrupt if the plan is really underfunded. And in many, many cases, the pension system itself, the pension plan itself that the company sponsored was actually in part uh, an impetus, you know, a, a driver of the bankruptcy itself. So you can think of all of the airlines out there that have declared bankruptcy. The Pension Benefit Guarantee Corporation has taken over most of those obligations. The entire steel industry, in effect, in the U.S., they've taken that on. And, and others, uh, some, some car company obligations. I'll, I'll go through some examples of some of the, uh, some of the defined benefit pension obligations they've, they've taken on. You know, by the way, when I say defined benefit pensions, that's nothing other than the traditional pension that uh, used to prevail as the model for retirement uh, in the U.S., right? So that's just when a company promises a worker that when that worker retires, the company will pay them a, a pension, you know, an, an annuity, basically, or a monthly amount um, that is a function of that employee's late career salary and years of service and some formula. So that's the, so the traditional pension model. Of course, we've transitioned a lot to... Uh, uh, the defined contribution model in the U.S., where people who are you know, entering the workforce today, they've never heard of these plans before. The only time they hear of them is maybe when they discover that their state or local government was going bankrupt because of them. Okay, but but in, in so uh, but in in, in general, um, uh, new employees are entering into 401k types of plans. But the PBGC still protects the retirement incomes of more than 40 million American workers and more than 26,000 private sector defined benefit pension plans. So this, uh, and you can imagine, I'll give you some numbers in a minute, but the legacy liability associated with these 40 million people is really large. And the U.S. government is on the hook for a lot of the unfunded benefits that companies have promised to, public employ or to, uh, to, to, to corporate employees, okay, to corporate employees. So uh, the Pension Benefit Guarantee Corporation was created by ERISA in 1974, ERISA was an act of Congress, the Employee Retirement Income Security Act, and it was created in response to some events that I'll be talking about 
uh, in a minute. But, it, you, you know, probably as I describe this, you're thinking, well, this sounds a lot like an FDIC for corporate pension plans, right? The FDIC insures, you know, banks, bank deposits. It is. It's really the PBGC is like the FDIC uh, for corporate pensions, whereas the, the, the FDIC is for, you know, is for banking assets. So there are two types of plans that are covered by the Pension Benefit Guarantee Corporation, and both of these have received uh, some attention uh, in the press in, in recent months. So one is uh, what are called single employer plans. These are the simplest kinds of, 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 uh, of plans because there's just one employer that sponsors them. Okay, so you know General Motors uh, was you know there, what was going to happen in the General Motors bankruptcy to the pensions was a major topic of discussion. In the end, the federal government didn't end up taking over the pensions now, but they probably will at some point in the future, let's be honest, right? So um, anyway, so that's a single employer plan where uh, the, um, the, you know, the company sponsors the pension plan, promises the employees the pensions, and, um, and, 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 that's, and, that's, and that's it. And so there are 33.6 million workers and retirees in those single employer plans. There are then also multiple uh, multi-employer plans, and that encompasses 10.4 million workers and retirees, uh, usually in unionized industries, because what's, what's happening is that there's collective bargaining agreements between employers within an industry, and those employers are all you know, uh, collectively paying into a multi-employer pension plan. And uh, you know, you can imagine what happens in these kinds of plans. I mean, every, every uh, if you think about a, uh, a sort of network where you have employers, you know, four or five different employers paying into one pension plan, of course, they're always saying the other guy should be the one paying in. I don't need to be the one paying in. So uh, these are the two types of plans covered by the Pension Benefit Guarantee Corporation. And I'm going to focus today on the single employer plans, which are, uh, the single employer plans are a, uh, are a bigger um, uh, you know, a, a, a larger, n- large number of workers, also uh, larger unfunded obligations at the end of the day. The multi-employer plans are also a very interesting area. These, the unfunded obligations are smaller relative to the single employer plans, but uh, they may actually be more immediate. Some of these multi-employer union plans are in very, 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 very dire uh, financial shape. So the bottom line, actually, of the, of the research that I want to talk to you about today is that the, uh, the government reports that the Pension Benefit Guarantee Corporation has a deficit of $32.5 billion. And they call it a deficit, but it's really a debt. It's an unfunded present. You know, they, they call it an unfunded obligation. $32.5 billion. That's what their own reports say. But we took a look at what their actual assumptions were in this report, how they arrived at that calculation, and we discovered that uh, not unlike the state and local governments that we've been studying that have $4 trillion of unfunded obligations to their, to their employees, that actually the federal government has also been violating the principles of financial economics when they value these unfunded obligations. And in fact, uh, when you estimate, uh, you know, when you do actual you know, true financial valuation, if you ask the question, how much would a hypothetical and very large private insurance company, how many dollars would they require to take on this this unfunded obligation, this insurance liability, we found uh, that the answer is around $358 billion. So the bottom line there is that, in essence, the federal government is on the hook for about uh, the present value of these unfunded obligations that the federal government has through the system is about 10 times what they report that it actually is. And uh, and so that's our our baseline answer. It's interesting, if you just add up if you want to try to understand that number, uh, you know, a, a number one could compare it to is if you just take all of the defined benefit, pensions, defined benefit pension plans that are sponsored by U.S. companies, you know, uh, that are not bankrupt, like, uh, you know, General Motors and Ford and, you know, some of the airlines that haven't yet uh, uh, dumped their pensions on the federal government. You add all that up, you add up all their assets, you add up all their liabilities, the gap is, uh, we find, is $1.2 trillion dollars. Uh, when you measure that, when you measure that properly. Now, because of the way the laws are written, uh, we don't think the, that the uh, federal government is ultimately going to uh, the, the, the present value of what the federal government has promised is not that 1.2 trillion, but it is 358 billion. And of course, it could you know it could grow and it could it could you know it, it could in theory get smaller if we have a really huge bull market in stocks or something like that, um, uh, or some other you know some other some other things change. Um, but this is another thing that we calculate in this paper is that this corporate defined benefit pension system in the U.S. is 
has an unfunded liability of $1.2 trillion. And that, that money's going to have to come from somewhere as well. Okay, so, you know, the, we think the federal taxpayers are explicitly on the hook for this much amount of money for these legacy pension liabilities from corporations. The total unfunded is this $1.2 trillion, and that's got to come from somewhere. Somebody's going gonna, is gonna, um, is gonna to have to pay for that. Um, so what is actually insured? What does this Pension Benefit Guarantee Corporation do? They insure the basic benefits that are earned before the plan's termination date, so before they go bankrupt. I'm going to give you some examples of some companies in a minute. And uh, the claim, that you, you know, the company can't ask the federal government to take it over unless there's severe fa- financial distress and an underfunding of the systems. So that usually means Chapter 11 bankruptcy. You know, if a company calls up the federal government and says, hey, you know, uh, we're in great shape, you know, we have a big pile of cash, we're still running, will you take over the unfunded pension obligation? They say no, okay? They have, and they're legally entitled to say no. Um, chapter 11 bankruptcy is usually what triggers this. And as I mentioned before, the government, the PBGC, which is, uh, again, it's called the government corporation. Uh, and uh, while there, you know, some say that it might explicitly not be a federal government obligation, just about everybody agrees that it pretty much is. Um, so the PBGC gets any assets that are in these unfunded plans but must assume the liabilities. And then they get in line with the unsecured creditors of the firm in the bankruptcy to try to maybe get something, squeeze something else out of the, out of the, um, uh, out of the firm. Um, what, is the, what is the federal government guaranteeing here? They are guaranteeing, for workers who retire at age 65, they are guaranteeing up to $57,477 per worker per year. That's what the federal government is guaranteeing uh, for uh, employees of corporations that sponsor these traditional defined benefit pension systems. And uh, so up to that amount. Now, that's a, if you're an airline pilot, that's not going to cover you. But if you're, you know, it's about anybody else who works for the airline uh, other than, than management, uh, it probably will cover the pension that you've been promised. So um, it's been estimated that, that that covers around 85 or 90 percent of the total promises the companies have made. This, th- these caps. And by the way, if you, you know, if the if the employee is going to retire later, like at age 75, it's the the guarantee is 169 thousand dollars, 169 thousand 756 dollars. That's a pension per worker per year that the federal government is is backstopping. All right, backstopping, regardless of whether the companies go bankrupt. So here are some fun examples. All right, so here's an example before the Pension Benefit Guarantee Corporation. Some of you may remember the Studebaker cars. All right, so the Studebaker Packard Corporation. This was before. This is in the world before there was this federal government guarantee. Okay, before before we had we had these kind of limitless uh, uh, guarantees on this stuff. The Studebaker Packard Corporation, 9th of December 1963, uh, they clo- they were closing shop. They closed their manufacturing plant in Indiana. And the assets that they had set aside to pay for the pensions they'd promised the employees were very far from sufficient to meet the promised pension obligations. And essentially, around two-thirds of the retirees and active workers saw essentially all of their benefits wiped out. All right, so that wiped out. So that, that was you know, viewed as being something, this is kind of bad, right? Another, another thing that was happening uh, before the PBGC was that uh, there would be vesting periods of 20 years and companies could lay off employees after 19. All right, so that, you know, when you have that, in, and remember that the, the, the employees did not have a 401k at that time. So, um, so some of these re- retirees and active workers were left really hard up as a, as a result of, of these kinds of bankruptcies. Um, so what was the reaction? Well, the reaction was to put in this, this uh, as usual, there was an, a regulatory overreaction. So the overreaction was, okay, well, we have to protect everyone now with these guarantees that they will get their pensions. So the PBGC was put in. So let's fast forward now to um, uh, another to a post PBGC uh, bankruptcy. The Bethlehem uh, Bethlehem Steel Corporation. That was in October. This is a typo. October 2001 bankruptcy is when that took place, not 2011. 2001. The Bethlehem Steel Corporation. And um, as usual for a firm that enters Chapter 11 bankruptcy, the assets were you know vastly insufficient to pay for the promises they had already made to 95,000 workers and retirees of this steel company. And the PBGC agreed under its laws, under the laws in, in 2002, to cover 92% of that total liability. And that left $3.7 billion in unfunded liabilities dumped onto the PBGC. So essentially, in this year here, you know, a few billion dollars in unfunded liabilities from one company got dumped on 
to the federal government. That was an October two, 2001 bankruptcy. That's a typo here. And they agreed in 2002 to, 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 cover, those, to cover those liabilities. So in one year, one company, $3.7 billion. Here's another example. United Airlines, I was able to find a picture of the old United Airlines planes. You know, most of us here are based in the uh, San Francisco area spend a lot of time flying around on the ones with a newer, you know, post-continental -merge, post merger logo. So I was able to find an older one. Anyway, uh, 9th of December 2002, United Airlines files for bankruptcy. The total unfunded obligations they had were $9.8 billion. Now, because they had a lot of pilots who were making way more than that $57,000 maximum, and in fact, that $57,000 was lower at the time, the, uh, the, only guarantee, the amount of the, uh, of the uh, uh, unfunded guaranteed benefits was $6.6 billion. But in the end, the PBGC ended up taking on a liability of more than $7.1 billion. So just as a result of, of, this, uh, uh, of, the, of this bankruptcy, due to a revaluation of the assets and the liabilities, it ended up being $7.1 billion that the, uh, the, the federal government just took on as an unfunded obligation, as a new, new federal debt, as the result of one company, one company's bankruptcy. And what is this kind of debt? This is debt. This is their promise that they're going to pay these employees. And so they're still paying for benefits for around 46,000 of the retirees in the four major pension plans of United Airlines. So if there's, these people are now getting checks not from United Airlines, but from the federal government through the, from the Pension Benefit Guarantee Corporation. The Pension Benefit Guarantee Corporation, in return, got around a 20% stake in the reorganized company. So the government actually owned 20% of United Airlines for a time, which was actually worth something in 2005. The value fluctuated. It wasn't worth an, an, as much to keep up with this. So this is an example of one where the government might have gotten out with something that made up for some of their, you know, of the unfunded liability they took on, but still, as a result of one bankruptcy, billions of dollars of new federal obligations were transferred from the private sector to the federal government. Okay, so um, how well, so let's look at this, let's now look at the system in total. Corporate defined benefit pension plans, these are all the pension plans that, uh, that the, uh, the corporations sponsor in the U.S. Well, as I've talked about before in the context of state and local government plans, uh, there is a real problem with how uh, most uh, entities value pension promises. There's a real temptation to say, yeah, I, you know, we've promised somebody a pension in 30 years or in 15 years, and don't worry, it's really not that expensive. We're not going to worry about it too much. We're going to assume that we're going to earn 6 or 7 or 8% on any assets that we put aside, and the pension won't, it, it just won't look like it's really much of a debt uh, at all, okay? Um, and the, it's interesting because the, the corporate defined benefit pension world, it used to be that there were funding rules that were, uh, that were pretty strict, that actually uh, uh, corporations had to measure uh, how much it would cost to uh, essentially pay off these pension obligations using treasury bonds. And they had to fund the pension system uh, over a certain number of years to, uh, you know, to that, 100% to that level. That is the regime that prevailed in the corporate pension world between around 1987 and around 2001, all right? So, so there was a period, and that's the way that economists kind of think it should be done, right? And if you promise somebody a deferred annuity, the cost of that promise is the cost of, of, uh, of putting together, you know, a portfolio of bonds that would allow you to pay that liability off. That's the economic cost of it. I, I'm teaching an open online course uh, this year called the Finance of Retirement and Pensions, and in that course, you know, one of the things we talk about a lot is that a pension promise is like a deferred annuity. And if you, you know, companies and the government, they, they, they are allowed to they have a lot of leeway in, 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 in how much cost they're going to, you know, how, how much cost they're going to attribute uh, to these pension promises. But finance and financial economics is very clear. The cost of such a promise is the cost that it would, you'd have to pay an insurance company or you know, a private sector entity to take over that liability. And that's pretty much determined by, you know, government bond, by the yields on safe assets. Um, so as a result, there's a, uh, just like in the, in the state and local government sector, also in the corporate sector, there's a problem now uh, with the undervaluation of these corporate liabilities. You know, basically the companies are not valuing the, the, the liabilities that they promised to employees properly. And in this case, with the corporations, the federal government is, the federal government is really allowing them to do it, because since 2000, there's been an erosion 
of the, uh, of, the, of the tightness of these funding standards. You know, it used to be, as I said before, between 1987 and, and around 2000, 2001, the federal government said, look, we're insuring these pension promises. You know, if these companies go bankrupt, we've we got to take on the obligations. We're insuring these promises, and therefore we're going to say you have got to, we're going to tell the companies you have got to fund these obligations using, you know, cons- relatively conservative assumptions, and you've got to fund them basically think about funding them the way an insurance company would fund them, to, to pay the true cost into these systems. Since around 2000, they, the companies have done a lot of lobbying, the laws have gotten more lax, and now these are the rates at which they're allowed to measure. So now we get the overall effective interest rate uh, was around six, you know, between 6 and you know, 6.6% uh, over the kind of past two years for which we have the complete data, and it's no better now, it's been worse in, 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 in 2012. I mean, this is essentially equivalent to being allowed to assume that every dollar they put in the pension fund is going to earn a return of 6.6% compound annualized going forward, which, you know, might be an okay thing to assume if you could scale back your spending. But keep in mind, this is, this, if they're unfunded, this becomes a federal government obligation. And it seems pretty clear from financial economics that if it's going to become a federal government obligation, the firms should have to value it using treasury discount rates, treasury yield curves. And that's what, the, that's what was concluded, actually, in the, in, the, uh, in the strict laws that were in place in the 80s and the 90s, uh, and it was abandoned in the 2000s um, through various legislation. And it's, it's a legislation that sets this. So, so the true rate, I think, if these are uh, going to be government obligations, the true rate to measure the, val- the, the liability is more like 3%. And as a result, if you take the data and you add up the pension plans of all of these companies, well, I guess not these guys because they've gone bankrupt, but uh, the ones of the ones that have not shed their pensions. So, you know, American Airlines did not, for reasons I'll tell you, they had a bankruptcy. They did not end up dumping it on the PBGC. Uh, if, you, if you just add up the, the reports, it looks like <laughs> the system has no unfunded liabilities at all. So, so people who would defend the current system would say, What's, what, is, what is Professor Rao talking about? The defined benefit pension system in the U.S. is fully funded. But the problem is that they're assuming it's fully funded under the assumption that every dollar that goes into these systems is going to earn you know, a 6.5% compound annualized return. Uh, and if you actually measure it properly the way we think it should be measured, and again, this is very parallel to work that I've done on the state and local government sector, um, you find an unfunded liability of about $1.25 trillion. So that means somebody is going to have to take a hit on that, right? So some, th- this has got to be, this is sort of a... Uh, you know, this is a, an unpleasant amount of money that has to be, the, the pain has got to be distributed somehow. This trillion has got to be eaten by somebody. How much is the federal government explicitly on the hook for? Well, that's my $358 billion number. Okay, the federal government, they say they're on the hook for about $30 billion. But we say that they're not doing the, uh, the measurement properly and that as a result, they're on the hook for, uh, for a lot for a lot more, okay, that they're, that they're on the hook for, for hundreds of billions of dollars and that they're not properly recognizing that. Where does the financing of these, of these operations come from for this uh, governmental entity, the Pension Benefit Guarantee Corporation? Well, it comes from four sources. It comes from uh, insurance premiums that are paid by the sponsors. So it is true that the companies have got to pay insurance premiums to this Pension Benefit Guarantee Corporation. Our $358 billion number, that's account, already counting for the, the, the value of those, of those premiums. So uh, that's already in there. But um, these premiums, you can imagine, these premiums are vastly insufficient. I mean, even calling them a premium is sort of a joke because they are vastly insufficient to pay for the value of the insurance that the firms are getting. Or put it another way, they're vastly insufficient to compensate taxpayers for uh, the cost of providing this insurance uh, to, to, the, to the companies. They also come from the fact that the PBGC uh, have they've taken over you know, these plans in the past, you know, like Bethlehem Steel and United Airlines. So they have some assets, and those assets earn some returns. So that's another, uh, another, another source. Um, interesting discussion about how the PBGC should invest those assets. I had a call once from somebody who wanted my opinion on whether the PBGC uh, should basically invest all of their money in equities. And I pointed out that the PBGC is an insurance company and that that would be, you know, kind of not very consistent with the way we think insurance companies uh, should operate. They'd be essentially investing in assets that would get hit really hard exactly at those times when 
uh, they end up with more liabilities coming from the uh, coming from the from the from the company. Um, so uh, so it's, it, it seemed like exactly the opposite of what they should be doing. But it's an interesting discussion. Uh, there is also you know they recover some assets from the bankrupt companies. Again, you know there's some assets in the pension funds that PBGC gets, um, and then uh, and then some assets of their own. Um, so uh, you know question general tax revenue. There are some who will swear up and down. This is a separate entity. If they run out of money, uh, there's no problem. They'll just uh, default on their obligations, and they can do that. But I think everybody acknowledges there's an implicit political guarantee that uh, there have been bills put forth before Congress to make this an explicit guarantee. And I think everybody recognizes that the PBGC would be, you know, that, that, that Congress will fund the PBGC. I mean, that seems to be something that people are taking as, as, as essentially uh, a given. Um, what are these uh, insurance premiums? They're very different from the actual insurance costs. Here's what the premium is. It's a flat rate premium. So the companies have to pay $42 per year per participant. All right? So 42 bucks per year per participant. And then they have to pay, for, the more unfunded they are, they have to pay a little more. They have to pay $9 per, hundred, per thousand of unfunded benefits capped at 400 per participant. It's kind of hard to see th- that this is vastly insufficient. The real problem is that premiums contain no risk adjustment. So here's a great quote from a friend of mine uh, who also works on this stuff. A financially distressed firm with its pension plan assets invested in a portfolio of risky assets that is mismatched with the plan's liabilities pays the same premium as a AAA-rated firm that has basically invested fully in bonds and is sure to be able to pay off its pension obligations. There is no consideration from the federal government that a firm that is, you know, got junk, is junk bonds and is, you know, going to go bankrupt in, in, in two years uh, because they're investing in risky assets uh, that they, uh, you know, and also that they're low rated, that they should pay a different premium from firms that are highly rated and have taken on less risk. So, um, so the premiums are really, I mean, if an insurance company, private sector insurance company operated like this, they would be bankrupt more quickly than you could possibly imagine. I mean, this is just, these, these, these are very, these are essentially arbitrarily set numbers. They're setting the premium numbers low and, and arbitrarily. Um, and in fact, there are a lot of firms out there. This is a graph that shows credit ratings. You know, these are like the credit, credit quality grades of the firms. You know, uh, uh, these are already you know, speculative grade firms in the middle. There's a lot of firms out there that the PBGC insurers that are just not in good shape and have a very high likelihood of dumping their obligations onto the government. And so another thing that we're doing in our research here uh, that I'm presenting to you, this $358 billion number, it accounts for the fact that there are a lot of firms out there uh, that are likely to go bankrupt, and we look at what the market implies about their default probabilities. So um, anyway, uh, essentially what we do is we recognize the fact that PBGC insurance can be viewed as a financial option. The option is the firm can dump the obligations onto the federal government when they go bankrupt. We are not the first ones to point that out. That was pointed out by Stanford's own uh, Bill Sharp in 1976, so that's been recognized for a long time. But uh, what we've done is we've valued this insurance We've actually done the calculations to value the insurance in a way that's consistent with the principles of financial economics and that's consistent with the fact that there are just a lot of firms out there that are very likely to go bankrupt and to dump their obligations on the federal government. And how do we know it's likely? We know it's likely because the market, the bond market is telling us that it's likely. You know, these firms firms with these bad credit ratings, the bond market is telling us that it's likely. So we're accounting for that um, as as well. Okay, so I, I guess I, you know, I, I was going to go through a little bit what's the problem, what's, what's, what's the fundamental valuation problem. Um, I, it's, you know, you've sat through several days of talks. I think this is probably not the appropriate time to bring out numbers on you. Uh, for you finance people in the room, I'll just say two sentences. So essentially what they do is um, uh, they, uh, they take the present value of future outcomes. And uh, essentially what they do is, they, this is a quote from their reports, each scenario's outcomes are discounted based on the 30-year Treasury bond yields projected for that scenario, regardless of whether the underlying cash flows are generated from equities, high-yield bonds, corporate bonds, or Treasury bonds. So what that means that they do is they, take a, they look at a dollar, all right, and then they project that dollar forward using some expected return on the assets, like, say, 8% compound annualized. And then they discount that back to a lump sum at a much lower rate, at a treasury rate. And that's just a money, that, you're in finance, so that's just simply a money machine is what that does. They, they're, they're creating money out of, out of nowhere. I mean, it's like saying I'm, I'm going to have a dollar. That dollar is going to be worth $2 in 10 years 
because something that earns you know, a 7 or 8% compound annualized return will double every 10 years. And I'm going to discount back that, that, that back to the present using a lower rate, and I get a buck 25. So basically, I've just turned a dollar in my accounting into, into, into a dollar into a dollar 25 just, just, by, just by doing that. So that's the problem with what they're doing in the reports. I mean, we read this, and we were just we were horrified. Uh, so what we're doing is actual financial valuation, the way that we'd say, what would an insurance company require to take this on? And the answer to that is $360 billion. And it depends on some assumptions. There's some numbers. You know, we, we stress test. There could be a lot more than that, right? So it, it depends on how binding these caps are, you know, these uh, $57,000 caps are, how binding those are. Depends a little bit also on, uh, uh, for the firms, on how long the duration is of the liability. So when the sort of average uh, time period of the cash flows is, is going to be. Um, uh, can the PBG? It's interesting. You know, what, what about? Can I? You know, can I leave you with any sort of uh, bright spots on this? Well, one one question is maybe the PBGC can decline to take over. So that's something. So uh, they and, and and there was a recent example where they succeeded in doing this. So American Airlines, AMR Corp, declared bankruptcy on the 20th of November 2011. They had four billion dollars in cash, and they said we're bankrupt and we can't pay the pensions. So the federal government said. We think that from the menu of things American can do, you probably don't need to terminate your pensions because they had $4 billion in, in cash sitting there. So the, you know, it ultimately, whether the, this is uh, allowed or not was left up to a judge. And in fact, American Airlines ended up freezing but not terminating the pensions, and they ended up uh, still having the pensions. So there is a little bit of, a, of, of leeway here. If the companies have a huge amount of cash, a court is going to say, no, you know, the federal government does not have to actually take these on. So maybe that's the bright spot I can say that you know, potentially if firms are really trying to game the system, there, there is some precedent here that uh, the federal government can say no. But if they don't have cash on hand, then it's not going to work. Um, I mentioned there was this thing about multi-employer plans, these union plans, very interesting area. Won't have time to talk about that, um, but uh, it's, a, it's a more imminent problem, but it's a, a financially a smaller, uh, a smaller problem. So um, they're saying, you know, the, the federal government is saying that the, uh, the liabilities for the, for the, for the uh, plans designated as probable insolvencies are around $7 billion. So I guess, you know, I don't, you know, we haven't studied this system in detail you want to take our same you know, 10x multiple and multiply that, you know, that's, still, that's still a major problem uh, you know, if it were $70 billion, But that would be an extremely back-of-the-envelope thing to do. I wouldn't, you know, one has to fully analyze this to say what the actual, what the actual liability is. Um, but, uh, but, but these problems could potentially be more imminent because this, this system is already, even under, under government accounting, uh, going to be totally bankrupt uh, in less than 10 years. So... Uh, conclusions from what I want to talk to you about today is that this uh, Pension Benefit Guarantee Corporation program is in much worse shape than revealed in the government reports, and the unfunded obligations are approximately 10 times what they are in the government reports. And I think that the lack of recognition of these true costs uh, gives an incomplete picture of the federal government's actual obligations for these legacy liabilities, and it also leads to more bad decisions being made along the way as we look at this insurance system. And you know, if, if the government continues to pretend that, hey, this is really not that expensive, we can give more guarantees, we can raise the level of guarantees, we can you know, do this in the name of encouraging companies to keep defined benefit plans, then we're going to end up Rolling, you know, we're going to end up in, you know, rolling in even more unfunded obligations because the measurement that we're doing now is not properly reflecting these costs. And it's, it's a very parallel set of issues to the state and local government uh, liabilities that I've talked about before, where there's $4 trillion of unfunded liabilities, $4 trillion there in that state and local government system. Uh, you know, CalPERS, CalSTRS, think about that across 50 states, $4 trillion. And the problem is that the cost recognition is, is so flawed that uh, you know, even states that try to make reforms, they miscalculate how beneficial it's going to be, and then they pretend that the problems are solved when, in fact, the problems keep getting worse. There's an analog to that at the, uh, uh, at the federal government level. I'll end with a plug for my massively open online course, which has 42,000 students, but it's not too late to sign up. So uh, feel free to sign up. It's on the finance of retirement and pensions. Uh, so we talk a lot about uh, accumulating assets, uh, decumulating assets in retirement, uh, annuities, uh, uh, some basic finance about stocks and bonds. And then I get into this defined benefit pension realm, you know, why it is that you can't project assets forward at an 8% expected return and discount them back at a 3% expected return and pretend that you have a fully funded pension. That, you know, so the, the, but that's, it sounds obvious, but that's something that, the, you know, that, that we're trying to bring to the general public, and um, Hoover has been really great about, the, about supporting this project and is uh, uh, co-sponsoring a symposium 
that we're going to have in January that's going to highlight the best student projects. So the student projects are the students have to pick a state or local government pension system, and they have to uh, assess the financial condition of that system, and then they have to uh, recommend some policy uh, changes to be made at the state or local government level. So I'm really looking forward to what some of these 42,000 students are going to come up with. I imagine we'll have a range of interesting proposals. Uh, and uh, the best ones we'll be selecting through a peer review process and also a curation process. And those will be featured here at Stanford. So hopefully we'll be grass, getting some grassroots solutions and uh, come up with some interesting ideas. So, um, so that's uh, what, I, what I've been up to lately. And uh, thanks very much for your attention. Happy to take some questions. This podcast has been a production of the Hoover Institution. Thank you for listening.